Okay, welcome to the second lecture. And this one is continuing with what um, we're gonna talk about for the next couple lectures, the search for truth, early photography, realism, and impressionism. So we'll look at today in this lecture, new ways of seeing photography and its influence. Uh, and then in the next lecture, we'll move to only the truth realism. And I'll talk about what realism means, because it might not be exactly what you think. Uh, and that'll be in France, like a lot of the modern art movements we're going to look at. And then after that, in later lectures, we'll talk about seizing the moment, impressionism and the avant-garde, Manet, Manet and Whistler, and from realism to an impressionism. Um, so that's where we're going in the next few lectures. So looking at Ole early photography, I think there's some thoughts about how photography affected art. Uh, and sometimes I agree with them, sometimes I don't. Uh, but there's some interesting things that people say about photography that makes it different than other types of arts. And I think one of them is something that an artist who we'll look at later, uh, much later, <laughs> when we get closer to now, Rauschenberg said that photography is like an instant collage. Um, so one thing to do is look at this Walker Evans photo, which is called Street Scene, Vicksburg, Mississippi, and try to think about, well, what might Rauschenberg mean? Like, how is a photograph an instant collage? So take a few moments and you can look at that. Maybe I'll make this an option for our next class discussion, because it might be a good one. Um, so take a few mi minutes and think about that, and then continue with the lecture. So I'll talk about the early history of photography. And in this part, it's really pre-photography as we know it. Uh, and the first thing we're looking at is the camera obscura. Um, and you can see it in this engraving. The George Eastman house, by the way, is uh, Eastman's the founder of Kodak. So he's got lots of cool photographic history. Um, so camera is Latin for room. And this was something that was discovered in the medieval period and especially used uh, beginning in the Renaissance that we know of for sure. And the idea is, is that you take a room that is very, very, very dark. Uh, it's got to be as dark as you possibly can. <clears throat> and you put a small hole, much smaller than it would look uh, in real life. So this isn't really to scale in it. Uh, and then, um, and that's it, literally just a hole and a dark room. Um, and then what will happen is the scene outside the light rays, which travel in a straight line, um, will go and make an image, a very dim one, but if the room's dark enough, it'll start to get brighter um, on the opposite wall. And as you can see, because the fact that light rays move in a straight line, um, light isn't actually rays, but just for the purpose of this, uh, light does move in a straight line, seemingly. Um, the image that'll appear on the opposite wall will be upside down. Um, some later people discovered you could use a lens to turn it right side up if you wanted to, uh, and to also bring more light in so that you would have a um, brighter image over here. And you're thinking this, you're thinking, this can't be true. Is this something that can actually be done? Uh, you can actually do this in your own house if you want. Uh, get some, you know, multiple layers of, of uh like curtains that block out all of the light and then kind of seal them to the edges of a window and then put a tiny hole in it. Uh, and you can make something like this that Morella is making. So this is camera obscura images of house across the street. Uh, and you can see with this one, uh, he took a photograph of what the camera obscura does. So this particular bedroom, obviously in the suburbs, as you can tell by the image, uh, it was completely blacked out except for a tiny hole in the opposite wall, which we can't see. And then what we see is outside that's across the street from the house. And as you can see, the houses are upside down. Um, but again, this image, which is brightened quite a bit so that it's visible, um, it doesn't seem like something could, that's possible to happen, but it's something very easy. And all you need is a tiny little hole. Uh, if you ever take a photography class, they'll have you make cameras and little boxes where it's just a piece of photo paper and uh, a dark box with a little hole in it and you can get the same thing. So before uh, photography as we know it, and I'll kind of explain what photography as we know it is in a moment, 
uh, people realized they could use this camera obscura to do new things with standard art mediums. Uh, so we're not absolutely sure if Vermeer, uh, who's an artist and I talk about in my other classes that live in the 17th century, used the camera obscura, uh, but we're pretty sure. Uh, and part of it is based on the idea that when you see uh, some of his images, um, he has some aberrations in the image that is probably due to the quality of the lenses at that particular time. So what Vermeer would have used would be a box that looks like this picture. You have a lens uh, that kind of increases the light gathering ability of the, um, of the hole, you know, instead of just having a hole, you have a light, you have a lens. And then um, the way this camera obscura would be used is they'd actually have kind of a hood over it so that it would darken this space. And then you could put your canvas in here and you could kind of draw out the lines. Um, and then you could paint it from there. So the belief is that Vermeer used this to kind of create the lines uh, and create the figures and objects in the space and then took it out of the camera obscura <clears throat> and uh, started to paint it. So this was useful right away to artists. Um, but the problem was, is this image, as soon as you take it away, it's gone. You know, unless you paint or draw over it, uh, you're not going to see it again. So some people thought it would be cool to be able to take this technology and mix it with other technology that was already known. Um, and that's the idea that if you cover a surface with certain types of silver, when they're exposed to light, the silver will turn black. And if any of you have relatives that have uh, old school silver sets for like uh, for the kitchen uh, and for the dining room, you know that they get black over time if you don't polish them. So it's the same idea when it's exposed to light, the brighter the light is, the more black it will become. Um, so if you were to mix this with the camera obscura, you could get something kind of interesting. The problem was, is people couldn't figure out how to stop the silver from going completely black. Uh, you could get, you could, ex, you know, kind of expose something with this silver, silver colored surface um, to some light and get an image but then it would fade all the way to black as it was continued to be exposed to light. So one of the things that some of the inventors discovered, uh, and they all discovered them independently, so we can't really say who is the inventor of photography, but William Henry Fox Talbot is certainly one of those. Um, he figured out a way to stop the silver from going all the way to black. So you could expose um, the paper that's covered in the silver and you could get a simple black and white image like we see here. And then um, he treated it again so that the image would, we call it stopping in photography. It would stop and then you would fix the image. Uh, we call it fixing once it's fixed. So salt fixed photogenic drawing negative. Uh, so how he made this is he just took a piece of glass to flatten the paper that was covered with silver um, and then just kind of pointed it out his window. So this is kind of like a courtyard. <laughs> I know it's hard to see in this one. So rooftop and chimneys in the, in the abbey. And then he used this process to fix it. And he had an image that still exists today, a very, very um, dim image. But as far as we know, it's the earliest surviving photographic image from Talbot. Um, but other people were working on this sort of thing, perhaps earlier in Talbot, but independently, he didn't know about it. Uh, and one of those is Nisifor Nieps, uh, and in 1826 or 27, with his own process, he was able to make another stop photograph where I think you can see a few more things. Um, so how they did this is they would expose this silver color paper uh, in, for eight hours. So you might imagine the only thing that you can take a picture of are things that are very still. So we just see buildings and yeah, it's like very grainy, almost like it was taken with a old school cell phone, but it is an image uh, and it is fixed. We can still see it today. It looks like this today. So over time, uh, people realized that there's some cool things you could do with this process. Um, so Talbot, uh, he realized that you could put plants and other items um, on the paper and then put some glass on top of it, expose it to light, 
and you get this almost, this is before x-rays, but this almost x-ray effect where you can see through the plants. Uh, biologists thought that it was super cool because they could see things that they couldn't see otherwise uh, in this photography. And um, Talbot, when he used this, he called it photogenic drawing. Um, but you'll call them like contact prints. You can also do these with, with scanners uh, and get the same kind of idea. So Talbot, uh, who had been making these photographs using a negative then to positive, and I'll show you what the positive looks like in a moment. He heard about Daguerre, who I'll talk about in a moment, um, who in 1839 announced a process of his own, a photographic process. So what Talbot did that was a little different than Daguerre, who we'll talk about in a moment, is um, just like I explained, when you cover the surface with silver, uh, the things that bright light uh, and the things that are brightly colored will show up black on the silver and then the opposite for dim things, they'll stay white. Uh, so what you get is a negative, um, blacks are white, whites are black, of an image. And then if you want to turn it around and make it look like real life, you just print it again. So you take the paper that you printed the negative on um, and attach it to another piece of paper expose it to light, and then all of a sudden you have a positive image. And that's what uh, William Henry Fox Talbot did here with the open door. Um, so William Henry Fox Talbot, he tried to be an artist and he thought he was pretty bad at it. Um, <laughs> I'm not gonna show you his art because uh, maybe he was pretty bad at it. So he thought, well, what can I do? I still think I have a good, pretty good eye. Uh, so he wanted to figure out a way to have the sun. And that's literally what's being done. Uh, the sun draw the pictures for him. Um, so this process where you use a negative, then a positive, uh, was more used by the artists we're going to look at in this section. And that's because in between the time that you make the negative and you make the positive, which is what we're looking at here, you can do a lot of things with it to make it look more expressive, something that we talked about in our class discussion so far. Uh, so that happened to fit the styles of painting that were happening at that time. And as we go through this lecture, we'll see the various things that artists can do uh, with this sort of positive negative process. So this is Daguerre. Uh, he, he developed a process named after himself called the Daguerreotype. So the daguerreotype was super cool and it actually became the um, most commonly used photograph pr process early on. Uh, but it wasn't the same as what Talbot was doing. Uh, Daguerre developed a process where he exposed the image on a metallic plate. And then when it was developed and fixed, the image was on that original plate. So what you're seeing in this photograph is the way it would look when it's positive. But if you actually hold, held this daguerreotype in your hand, depending on the angle you look at it, it'll look negative or positive. Um, so you have to kind of like tilt it in your hand to get the, neg the positive image. So this is really cool. You can get like pretty artistic images. This is like a still life or natur mort as the French would say, uh, as Daguerre would say. So you can get some pretty cool images, but you can't change it once you've made the image. Uh, so even though that this image uh, making process gives you really high quality images, as, as we'll see in a moment, um, it doesn't allow you to change it once you make the image. Um, you can, but you know, it's easier to change it if you use a negative and positive process. But this particular process was well promoted by Daguerre and it became pretty cheap. So this was how most of what the early photographs that people had were. So this is another example of a daguerreotype, an early one, this is 1839. And he did a long exposure for this one. So this street that he's doing, Le Boulevard du Temple, is actually a very crowded street. Um, but the exposure, meaning how long he exposed the uh, photographic plate to the light before he fixed it was eight to 10 minutes. Um, so this was actually a very busy street and it was full of people but why don't you see any people? So maybe take a couple of minutes and see if you can figure that out and then start the lecture again. And I'll tell you why. Uh, first thing I would do is look for is if there is somebody that you can see in this picture, 
And if you look closely, there is one person. And that's a person at a shoe sign booth. But you might notice you can't see the person shining his shoes. And the reason why this person showed up on the plate and all the other people that were walking down the street and filling the streets here didn't is because he stayed still long enough during this exposure to show up on the photographic plate. Everybody else was moving the entire time. So we don't see them. It's like they disappeared. So you can kind of see the downside to this early version of the process and that because the exposure is so long, you can't take a picture of a person and then unless they're willing to be very still. <laughs> and then even then, eight to 10 minutes is too long to be still to get a good image like you do of all these buildings. So eventually what was done is Daguerre, Daguerre was able to take down the exposure time to less than a second. Um, and this process um, became the preferred medium for portraits. And part of the reason why is because it was really cheap. It would just cost um, the equivalent nowadays of like maybe 10 to $20. Uh, and this is in a world where the only way you could get an image of yourself would be to hire a painter. It would be far more expensive than that. Um, so you can see in this man seated in front of a painted backdrop, you can get a pretty good image of a person. Um, the exposure is still relatively long compared to photographs today. Uh, so you tend to see people not smiling and trying to keep their face as stiff as possible. Uh, and that's why in these early photographs, you see people not smiling because when you smile, it's harder to hold your face in position. You also tend to see them leaning on things because that way they can stabilize and stay still for the picture. And a lot of these portrait studios that made these, they would actually have something that would go up your cloak in the back that would kind of stiffen you and hold you in place. But since these were so cheap, this basically democratized image making. Before this time, if you wanted to have an image of yourself uh, or someone that you love or some one of your friends, uh, you had to hire a painter to do it. But now you had something that just cost um, practically nothing compared to what paintings cost, and you could have images. And this changed um, the world in some ways. It made it possible for people who were just regular folks and weren't rich or elites in some other way, they could get images of their people. Um, so imagine a world, if you were born in the 19th century, uh, you wouldn't, if your grandparents died, you wouldn't, you might forget what they look like uh, because you would have no idea. Uh, um, you would just rely on your memory and you would have no pictures of them. So with this daguerreotype process, it made it possible for um, most regular people of modest means to be able to get images of themselves. And that's kind of huge. That's a new thing for the world and something that had never really happened before. One thing I should mention though, is that nowadays, uh, we have imagery everywhere. We all carry cameras around with us if you have a smartphone. Um, and the amount of images that are made in say a single day uh, on this day today is more than all the images that were made in the entire 19th century. Uh, so we kind of see a long democratizing of imagery where everybody can get um, make and preserve images. So a lot of these images, they kind of show people who couldn't afford painters um, and it can kind of show the things they do. So a lot of people do just like they do nowadays. If you want to get a portrait, they'll show their hobbies. Uh, so this is a butterfly collector and he's got all these great butterflies. Uh, the cool thing about these daguerreotypes, you can kind of see the size of them. Um, they seem pretty small. It's seven by eight centimeters. But remember, the surface they're using to make the photograph is the same as the photograph. This is the same plate. So think about your phone or if you have a more expensive digital camera and think about how large the sensor is. Uh, it is not seven by eight centimeters. It is much, much, much smaller than that. So when you have a basically a bigger sensor, that's what this um, metallic surface is, uh, then you can get more detail. So to demonstrate, I'll kind of bring us in really close to this guy. Uh, and even if I brought you in closer, you would just see more and more detail. So these images, even though you couldn't really modify them once you made them, um, they were interesting in being able to 
portray things very, very precisely. But as I said, artists were more interested in the positive negative process that people like Talbot were using, because once you made the negative image, you could do all kinds of cool things with the positive image. Uh, so this Oscar Rielander, The Two Ways of Life um, from the 1850s, pretty early on in the history of photography, but he's doing amazing things. So one disadvantage of photography is that you're kind of stuck with the light is, that is in front of you. Um, and at this time, electric lights weren't really a thing and, and gas lights were um, not very practical. So you had to work with the light that was in a room. And people could make rooms where they could kind of control the amount of light coming in. But say if you wanted to do what a painter does, where you have a bunch of figures and you want to make sure that they're lit in similar ways um, so that you can see all the figures. Or maybe you want to darken some so that they're not as obvious. With photography, if you just want to take one photograph of all these people in a room, it would be almost impossible to do because everybody, the light would be hitting people in different ways and you couldn't emphasize things like you wanted. So how Oscar Rielander did this is he took separate photographs of figures or groups of figures. And these are all separate photographs. Like this is probably one photograph. This is one photograph. Um, this one, these two figures is one photograph. And what you can do with the positive and negative process is take these separate photographs, take a picture of the background, and then you can print all these separate photographs onto one photograph. It is a diabolically difficult thing to do, and it takes requires a lot of patience. I've done it myself. Uh, how the photographer would do it is they take all their separate photographs, and they have all these negatives, and they have a photograph of the background. And you would expose your photograph of the background, but just the background that you needed. And then each time that you wanted to put in a figure, you basically um, cut out some cardboard with just enough space for the figure and then expose your negative onto the paper again, but just in this teeny little part. And when you do it, you kind of have to, you can't just hold your cutout still because otherwise it'll, there'll be this weird ring around the figure and you'll notice that it was pasted in there. Um, so you would have to uh, kind of move it around and hope that it's lined up correctly. And then you do, just do that on the paper with each of the figures. Any part of this process, you can mess it up and make it look bad. And you have to start all the way over again. Uh, so Oscar Rielander probably tried this <laughs> tens of times, maybe hundreds of times before he got it right. Uh, but as you can see, once you have it all together, and this is before Photoshop, like the, the process I described to you um, takes hours or days to be able to do it, even after you've already collected all the photographs and, you know, costumed everyone and lit them the way you wanted. Um, so very complex process compared to what you do with Photoshop, uh, but you get similar types of results. Um, so this particular photograph, uh, and photographers that are doing stories, these sorts of things, they wanted to make art. So one of the ways that you can convince people that the work you're doing is art is you can reference or make an allusion uh, to an allusion with an A. Uh, you can make an allusion to previous art pieces. So with this one, Rielander was talking about um, Raphael's The School of Athens from the Renaissance. Uh, so his picture was structured in a similar way. You have a center line and then you have two different philosophies. Uh, and we have um, Plato and Aristotle here. So we have Aristotle and then Leonardo da Vinci as, um, as, Pla as uh, Plato. So we have two different ways of looking at the world. And that's what Oscar Rielander wanted to do with he his. Um, he's got kind of the people um, who are doing work and with this almost like Virgin Mary type figure. And then we have people over here that are more hedonistic and having fun and drinking and apparently just laying naked uh, as part of that. And we can see people smooching in the background. Uh, so two ways of life, a little different than the philosophy thing, but perhaps similar to, to it. And then with this one, Henry Peach Robinson, uh, this is also multiple photographs printed on the one piece of paper. So what I would do is kind of pause and look at this photograph 
and see if you can tell which photographs are separate from this room scene, from the background scene. So pause it, see if you get some things. Okay, start the video again, and I'll show you some things that I picked out that are separate photographs. I think this bowl is a separate photograph. And part of the reason why you might do that is because it would be hard with the light coming from the window falling onto this woman with the baby, uh, she would block off the light here. Uh, so kind of difficult to get him lit, to get the bowl lit correctly. I think that either this figure or this figure, um, is also a separate photograph, but I'm guessing it's this figure uh, because the light is, again, hitting him pretty nicely from the window and not obscured by the figure there. So with this one, it's really difficult to tell that there was multiple photographs made. And what Henry Peach Robinson would do would actually do what artists had done before this. He would think of the picture and he would make drawings of it. And then he would make multiple photographs and then assemble the picture as in his drawing. So do kind of what painters did, except with photographs. Um, so this is an example. Uh, and if you've ever tried to take a picture of animals, <laughs> to uh, especially a group of animals, to get them where they're just at the right spot um, is really difficult. Uh, so you probably couldn't get these two figures and all the animals doing their thing at the same time. Uh, so what he did is he took a picture of the two figures and then stood around <laughs> with the sheep until they arranged themselves into something nice uh, that was close to what he did with his drawing. And then took these two photographs together and printed them on the one. And he got something that was kind of like a painting, but it was with photography. So later, um, later photographers and scientists, because it's hard to say if Anna Atkins is a scientist or a photographer or both. Uh, with the Ceylon, it's called a cyanotype. And they just call it that because when you print it, uh, it has this blue background, uh, so cyan. Um, and they sometimes call these images where you press something um, in between your photographic surface, which is either glass or metal or paper, um, and you cover it with something to flatten it and then expose it to the light. Um, and you get these incredible images where you can almost see through the plants. You can see fine structures of plants. Uh, so they're sometimes called photograms. And if you ever take a photography class, you do this either with old school pho photographic techniques or using a scanner. Um, but you can get the same sort of effect. You're exposing light and then make an image with the light through um, a three-dimensional object. So sometimes they call these photograms. And scientists thought this was was amazing because before and a time of x-rays, it was a way that they could see inside of the structures of organic things uh, and really see how they work. So Julia Margaret Cameron, um, just what, like we saw earlier with the earlier photographers, wanted to make art. Um, so what she did was make portraits. And remember how we were talking about the genres uh, and portraits was one of the more important ones. Um, and she wanted to make artistic portraits. Uh, luckily, her and her family were connected to a lot of pretty interesting people. Uh, and her idea with these portraits was to capture the character of the um, people that are in the picture. And this is something the artists that made paintings and drawings wanted to do as well. Uh, so she can do that in many different ways. Uh, one of the ways is to control the light. Uh, so she had a room where she could have panels towards the top of the room and control how the light was coming in. And you can see how Darwin in this one, he's lit very strongly on one side and then not so much on the other side. And she also used a quality of lenses that shows up in your photographs called depth of field to emphasize certain things in a picture. So most of the time when people look at this picture, the first thing they notice is Darwin's eyes. And that's because Darwin's eyes are in focus and a lot of the other aspects of the picture aren't. So how that works is depth of field. Um, and it's actually easier to illustrate if you look up depth of field. Uh, but basically the idea is the depth of field is um, how wide the area that is in sharp focus between the camera and the background. So if you have a wide depth of field, that means everything from the camera 
So very far off background is in focus. Um, and in those sorts of depth fields, that would be good if you want to take a picture of nature or something. But generally, when you take pictures of people, it looks better if you have a narrow depth of field. So you can see that um, Darwin's front shoulder and his face are in focus, but then the back of his face, so his right eye and his beard and his right shoulder aren't in focus. So there's a very depth of, narrow depth of field, and that can allow the artist to um, kind of focus on what you want to see. Uh, and if you think of Charles Darwin, who's one of the most important scientists that ever lived, uh, and by this time was already pretty famous in 1868, um, had developed develop the mechanism uh, and describe the mechanism of natural selection, which led to one of the most powerful theories in science, um, the theory of evolution. Um, and you can kind of see his focus. So it was a very difficult theory to come up with and it took decades of work. And once he did it, uh, many people questioned the theory as they should. Um, and his theory survived. So you can kind of see that focus in his eyes. Um, so I think in this case, Cameron was pretty successful in capturing the character of the figure. So I'll read a quote, um, what Cameron was trying to do with her portraiture. She says, photography is a marvelous discovery, a science that has attracted the greatest intellects, an art that excites, excites the most astute minds and one that can be practiced by an imbecile. Uh, so photographic theory can be taught in an hour, the basic technique in a day. But what cannot be taught is the feeling for light. It is how light lies on the face that you as an artist must capture. Nor can one be taught how to grasp the personality of the sitter. To produce an intimate likeness rather than a banal portrait, the result of mere chance, you must put yourself at once in communion with the sitter, size up its thoughts and his very character. Uh, so I think um, with this portrait of Darwin, uh, that uh, Julia Margaret Cameron was pretty successful in showing a very focused and thoughtful individual. We can kind of see how his brow um, is furrowed as if he's thinking of something important. Uh, so with this one, Henry Taylor, who's a poet, uh, she uses again, like lots of shadow. You can see how the lights hit, hit falling on his face here. And then narrow depth of field, we just see one part of his face in focus. Uh, and dresses him up wearing a hat that shows um, the hat of an artist. Uh, these are the types of, or a philosopher. Uh, so artists would often show themselves in these types of um, costumes to show something about their character. Um, so we can see that here with an old painting of Rembrandt that he made of himself wearing the same sort of hat. Uh, and he's looking at the camera uh, and Taylor's looking it away but we get a similar type of effect, this kind of darkened background um, and the way that Rembrandt makes everything kind of like fuzzy at the edges. Uh, camera, Cameron sets up her camera, <laughs> hard to say when her name is like camera, so that we have the same sort of fuzziness and the same sort of dark light. So she would also um, use figures uh, in such a way that they would have a little bit of movement uh, so if somebody moves a bit while they're, the picture is being taken, uh, you'll see this kind of like fuzziness that will imply the movement. So with this one, Venus chiding Cupid, depriving him of his wings, uh, you have the small child who represents Cupid. And then um, Venus, it almost looks like she's swooping in, which she probably did over and over again when the photograph was being taken. You can see how the lines are kind of blurred here, and it gives the effect of some motion. Um, she's also letting some of the things be out of focus uh, to represent how artists uh, would use big paint strokes at the time, which was popular at the time. Um, so she's creating art, you know, by her form, you know, by this focus, uh, this soft focus and the motion of the figure. Uh, but also she's doing it with subjects. So she recreate religious and mythological themes. Uh, so saying, basically saying, I'm an artist and here's why. Uh, so in response to some of the criticism that her pictures were out of focus, uh, which she was doing intentionally, um, she said, what is focus? Who has the right to say what focus is the legitimate focus? My aspirations are to ennoble photography and to secure for it the character and uses of high art by combining the real and the ideal. 
uh, and sacrificing nothing of truth, which he capitalizes by all po possible devotion to poetry and beauty. She also capitalizes poetry and beauty. So for her, she's saying, you know, I could just take a picture of things, but I'm not doing that. I'm an artist. I'm modifying it in a way so that I can create something um, that is beautiful, that is poetic, uh, that is my own expression as well. Um, so this one, it's called Mary Hillier, Elizabeth, and Kate Kuhn. Uh, but I think most of you might recognize right away that it represents um, Mary. Uh, so Mary the Virgin um, from the Bible uh, and also in the Quran. Uh, and you can see how uh, she is, uh, she dresses her in this head covering, which for people at the time, it would say, oh, this is a biblical figure. Um, and then she, after she takes the photograph, she pastes, um, I'm not sure how she did it, maybe a, a piece of wire or something, uh, something on the photograph to make it look like a halo. Uh, so she exposes that again to make it look like Mary has a halo. And then the children, <laughs> the figure who's playing Mary, whose name is literally Mary, uh, she was able to keep very still, but the children weren't. Uh, but that has a cool effect of movement because, I mean, children aren't usually staying still. Uh, so again, having this very, very like expressive type of image, uh, which again is a word that you all use to describe modern art. So Nadar was probably um, the second most or maybe slightly more famous than Julia Margaret Cameron as far as taking photographs of uh, famous people uh, during the 19th century. And at this time, uh, he's actually taking a picture of Senator Bernhardt, would, who would be in Europe, one of the most famous people uh, a few years after this photograph was taken. At the time, she was just a model. Um, so when I say a model, I don't mean a fashion model, uh, although she could have been. Uh, what I mean is a model for artists. Um, so photographers needed models as well, if they wanted to take some cool photographs. Uh, and Nadar is doing this. And Nadar created a very complex studio uh, where he had all kinds of sliding panels and a room so he could kind of mess around with the light as he wanted. Uh, and he would have costumes for the figures. So you can see she's wearing this thing that looks like either a dress or a curtain. Um, and at this time, like taking photographs that were nudes, some artists did it, but generally it wasn't seen to be as... Um, acceptable as it would be for painting. Um, so he kind of compromises by she's in, you know, she's probably not wearing anything here. Uh, and then creating this loose fitting um, garment, but it also represents like what Greek artists would do where they would have these incredible folds uh, in the garments of their figures. So ancient Greek artists uh, to show um, the kind of like rationality of Greek thinking. Uh, so he's got a little bit of that. And in case you didn't notice, it was a harking back to ancient Greece and Rome. You also have this pillar that looks like uh, an ancient Greece, Grecian pillar. Um, so Sarah Bernhardt's only 20 at the time this photograph was made, but she was later pretty famous. Uh, and Nadar is actually using um, similar techniques uh, to what Julia Margaret Cameron used. Uh, he has a very narrow depth of fields. You can see some of the things that are farther away and closer to us are out of focus, but her face is in good focus. Uh, having the light just coming in from one side, so it creates this dramatic effect on her face. Uh, whenever you have some pretty good shadows in a photograph, then it tends to um, emphasize the texture. So if you want to have someone's facial features stick out a little bit, create some shadows on their face and then um, depending on how you create them, you can get different effects on the face. So he could take another photograph, change the light of her, and she would almost look like a different person with a slightly different shaped face. So this one's kind of gruesome, um, but it also showed another thing that photograph uh, photography was good at, perhaps too good at, uh, and that was documenting real life. Uh, so this is Timothy O'Sullivan, uh, but he worked for a person who, before um, the Civil War, so if you're not familiar, the Civil War in the United States was from 1861 to 1865. Um, before the war, Matthew Brady was pretty rich, and he heard about photography, and a lot of people before the Civil War started, they thought that it would be this heroic battle, and it would be very short, 
and everybody would want to remember all of these heroic battles and look back to them um, and think about all the heroism and sacrifice and, and they would get patriotic and all that sort of thing. Um, so Brady was like, cool, I'm going to invest in this technology. I'm going to train a bunch of photographers. And I'm going to send them out to battlefields and have them take pictures. Uh, the only problem was, is that battles at this time uh, were with guns, uh, but they were guns that were different than the ones today. These guns had a lot of smoke. So once a Civil War battle would start, uh, people would fire their guns, and then you couldn't see anything. And this includes the people who were actually in the battle. They really couldn't see anything either. So if you tried to show up at this battle with your photographic setup, you could take a picture of a cloud that might show some people on it but you're not going to see any heroic battles. Uh, so Brady couldn't get what he wanted like he was thinking of with the, with the paintings that show heroic battles and conflict because uh, you couldn't see anything. Um, so what the photographers did was take the after effects. And what photography does really well is show things exactly as they are. And it wasn't very heroic. Um, when you show dead people, and in some of these cases, we're seeing dead people have been sitting there for a few days, it looks horrific, exactly, exactly as battles would be experienced uh, for the people that are fighting in them and then the people that see the aftermath. Um, and this is going to sound really gross, but if you know anything about how civil wars were fought, you know that this picture that's being taken where you have a bunch of bodies in the middle of the field couldn't happen. Uh, because they didn't generally die in fields. Uh, instead, the, the fighting would be in foxholes and various ramparts. Uh, so they'd be in very narrow area, areas, and most people would die in these like foxholes or in very narrow areas that were hard to photograph. So this is really kind of disgusting, but uh, O'Sullivan said, we need to get something, so drag the bodies out and make a good picture. Uh, so that's what they did for this one. But as you can see, when you see the bodies, there's nothing romantic about this battle. In this particular battle, uh, the battle at Gettysburg was the, one of the most brutal uh, in the entire war. Gettysburg is a field, as you see here, surrounded by farms that's relatively empty in southern Pennsylvania. Um, and the forces from the north and the south met each other uh, for three days. And in those three days, 25,000 people were killed uh, in a spot that is no bigger than um, Henry Ford campus, if you're listening to it from here. Uh, so I'd actually visited this place myself uh, on a field trip and then researched um, some of the battle to do a presentation there. But once you get there, I'm not a believer in ghosts, uh, but you can't help but be disturbed by the thought of all the uh, murder that had gone on in this space in just a, such a short period of time. So you, you might imagine, and the war, uh, and the Civil War led to more deaths um, by percentage than um, any official war uh, that the United States fought. Um, the wars that the United States fought against Native Americans led to higher percentages of deaths, but um, this one, as far as like official wars, one, wars that uh, the United States government recognizes. Um, so in this one, uh, after the war was over, most people didn't want to think about the war because it was brutal. People had known uh, people who had lost their lives or limbs or had been, you know, damaged and, and uh, could never function again. Uh, and the war is one of the most terrible things that had happened. So then you want to remember it. So unfortunately for Brady, uh, he went bankrupt because of this. He couldn't sell the photographs. But the artists he trained, like Timothy O'Sullivan, went on to become really great photographers. They used the skills that they learned uh, in trying and sort of failing to make battle photography uh, and were able to use it to make other sorts of photographs. So this is another one that's technology sharing. Uh, and it's kind of interesting uh, because it's a type of technology that you may or may not have seen before. Um, but you'll, I think you'll understand it because it's basically how movies are made. Uh, so this is Edward Mybridge. And like, <laughs> if you think his name has extra letters, uh, that's true because he wasn't born with all those extra letters. I think he put them in there to sound fancy. Uh, 
Uh, and this is his galloping horse motion study, Sally Gardner. Um, and it's owned by Leland Stanford. If that name sounds familiar, uh, Leland Stanford is who Stanford, the fancy college in California, is named after. Uh, but at this time, he was just a rich guy who would become the governor of California, uh, as rich guys often do become governors. And there was this idea in the 19th century uh, where scientists and artists also were wondering about horses galloping. Um, There's basically a controversy. They thought, when horses gallop, um, do all of their feet come off the ground, their hooves come off the ground at the same time? Um, so that was one controversy. And then the other one is, if they all come out at the same time, uh, were the hooves off the ground when they were splayed or were they off the ground when the hooves were um, close to their body? So from this photograph, these series of photographs, you can see that it answers both questions. Uh, if you look at the bottom left, yes, all four hooves come off the ground at once. And it is when their hooves are underneath their body. So if you look at the splayed ones, no, they always have hooves touching. But if you look at the ones where they're all under their body, yes, they do. So how was this photograph taken? Because it's basically showing things that the human eye can't see because they move too quickly. Uh, so what happened over time with, the, with photography is uh, photographers figured out how to make shorter and shorter exposures uh, to the point where they were getting very tiny fractions of a second. And you could use these cameras to stop motion faster than the human eye could see. Um, so how this was set up was kind of ingenious. Uh, and you can kind of see why you would need someone like Lee and Stanford who's really rich to make this photograph. My bridge had cameras that could go really fast, but he couldn't afford multiple cameras. Um, so he couldn't really study motion. So what he did is he had the horse run down a track and there were cameras uh, evenly spaced along the track. And um, there's trip wires attached to the camera. And when the horse would run past the trip wire, it would yank on the camera and make it take a picture. Um, and that way you could, you know, kind of stop the motion of the, uh, of the horse at each camera. So you can see how many cameras he had to get for this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, a camera for each, um, photographic image. Uh, but it was successfully in, enabled people to stop, um, motion and scientists were like, really amazed at this because now they could really understand how things move, even if they move too quickly for the human eye. So my bridge um, and Stanford actually had a bet. <laughs> I don't know how much it was uh, with another rich guy on those two controversies, whether all who four hooves are off the ground and um, if the hooves are splayed when they're all off the ground. I don't know if he won the bet, but he gave MyBridge a bunch of money to continue making these types of photographs. Um, so MyBridge is from the Eng England, but he moved to the US where he met Stanford. Uh, he was originally a landscape photographer, uh, but when he met up at Stanford, he was able to make these pretty cool stop action photographs. So what you wanna do, and I'll put this in the description for the video, is you could check out a bunch of these images they didn't have a way when these images were made to animate them, to run them. But nowadays, you can just make a GIF with them, with the images, and you get something that looks like a movie. So they couldn't see these as movies in 1878. Um, but now we can take these images and we can basically make movies. So I'll include the link down here. But if you look up MyBridge and then on Google image search and just put GIF, you'll find hundreds and hundreds of them. Uh, so it's super cool. It's, it's a, a movie before there were movies. So MyBridge used some of this investment that he got to make things for um, scientists, basically. And he called um, these pictures that he made animal locomotion. Uh, and he called his camera a zoopraxiscope. Uh, so zoo, which means animals, and uh, scope which means C, and then praxis, which means um, actions. Uh, so it's 
the actions of animals and it helps you to see them. Um, so this one, uh, it was meant to be scientific and you can kind of see how he has grids uh, behind it, but maybe it didn't function that way super well. Um, and I'll tell you why, like what order do you think these photographs are going in? Do you think uh, the first photograph in the series is up at the top left, at the top right? Maybe after it goes, if it starts from the top left or top right, does it go to the left or to the right? Uh, so I don't actually know the answer. <laughs> so maybe that's a problem for science, but you can kind of look around and see if you can figure out uh, what order the images are in. Uh, so this is animal locomotion. And in the late 19th century, uh, uh, most people kind of thought about this beforehand, but scientists were increasingly kind of convinced that humans are just another animal, uh, which is basically what all scientists believe today. Uh, you know, a pretty amazing animal, but still another animal. So they actually included people in animal locomotion. And since animals are naked, they also had the people be mostly naked. Uh, but as you might imagine, some of them, yeah, it will be scientific to see the motion of people naked. Uh, but he also has a shirtless woman uh, jumping rope. <laughs> so yeah, these were these could be potentially scientific, uh, but they're also kind of titillating at the same time, kind of creating some soft pornography. Uh, so you can see how his setup got more complicated. Uh, he has three banks of cameras where you can see the tripwire would send off um, each image you'd be able to see from three different angles. Uh, so that would allow people to um, study humans a little bit more closely. But as you might imagine, a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, it's women jumping rope that are naked. And he had other ones where one woman who was naked would pour like a big jug of water over another one. Um, so yeah, it works, but might also be for other reasons. So another photographer came up with another method of uh, capturing motion. But instead of having separate photographs, he had a setup where you could print um, all of the various parts of the motion onto one, um, onto one print, onto one photograph. Uh, so that was Etienne Jules Marais. Uh, he's French, as his name suggests. And he called his camera um, a chronophotographic camera. Uh, so chrono means time, and then photographic is exactly how we use photographs nowadays. Um, so in this one, how he did it is probably pretty complicated, complicated seeming, but it's actually pretty simple once I explain it. Uh, so let's look at some pictures. Uh, so you can see someone pole vaulting, very strong person that looks like they can pull off. Uh, so how this was done is he used this thing that was like, some of the same technology they were using for machine guns, which was developed in the 19th century uh, for worse purposes and making cool images. Um, and he used this mechanism to be able to um, do a rapid fire series of photographs. So you could set up your, your photograph, your camera, and you just have one of them. And then um, you pull the trigger and it'll take photographs at very precisely timed intervals, just like the machine gun fires bullets at precisely timed intervals. And then you would get a series of prints that look like this. And so to print it, you would basically just run it backwards onto a, a piece of paper uh, and expose it onto the piece of paper, run light through it. And then you would get um, a photograph showing the motion um, on one piece of paper. So perhaps this influenced uh, some of the painters of the day. This is Degas and his Frieze of Dancers, uh, the one on the painting on the top. And um, some people look at this and they say, okay, this is multiple dancers in the photograph, but other ones say, hmm, maybe we're seeing the same dancer from different angles. And he has two figures where they seem, all three of the figures here seem to have red hair, which is pretty unusual for people to have red hair. Uh, so perhaps it's, he was trying to do something similar as what, uh, Murray was doing. And Degas himself was fond of photography and would make images kind of similar to what Murray was doing. Uh, so perhaps he was influenced by that. And wanted to go back with this one. So this is something you may recognize if you're familiar with how motion is made in video games. 
you may notice that um, in video games, sometimes the um, people or characters in them look pretty good, but not perfect. Uh, but the motion often looks amazing, like it looks real. Uh, and part of the reason why is because they use basically the same process uh, that Murray used here. So a cool thing about, it's kind of a disadvantage, but also an advantage of uh, photography is that it's not as good at, as our eye is at resolving high contrast images. So if you look at something where there's just a lot of dark and a lot of very bright, our eye can see things that are in between the bright and the dark. But um, photography as a technology can't do it. And you can kind of like test this with um, your camera if you have like an iPhone or, or another camera. It's also not quite as good at your eye at seeing both very bright and very dark images at the same time. Another example you can look at is if you look at pictures of the moon landing, um, the moon landings in the 19, late 1960s and early 1970s uh, by NASA. And you'll notice when you see those pictures, you see the astronauts, but there's no stars in the sky. But the astronauts, when they were standing on the moon, there were stars everywhere and just like lighting it up so bright. Uh, so the reason why you can't see what the astronauts could see is because the stars in the sky, they look bright to our eyes because our eyes can adjust to it. But um, the surface of the moon and the white spacesuits that they were wearing were too bright. So the camera could either see the spacesuits uh, as being something that you could, you know, you could see, see the details of the spacesuits, or you could show the stars and the spacesuits would be really, really white and you couldn't see anything. It would just be like a white flash. Uh, so the photographers on the moon, they chose showing the spacesuit so you can't see the stars. So to take advantage of this, um, Murray realized if you take his acrobats and dress them in all black and then just put some white reflective tape on them, it can basically filter out their bodies and you just see what scientists would call the vectors. Um, lines of the motion of the figure. So this is exactly how video game motion is created. Uh, they put sensors uh, on um, actors, acrobats, stunt people, uh, and then they film them. And basically you get the motion, like it's a series of lines, and then they can put whatever character they can animate it in the video game over that. Uh, so the result of this was something that was in some ways even more scientific uh, than what uh, Mybridge was doing, because what scientists usually are doing with experiments is they want to filter out most of what you would see, uh, and that way they could test their hypothesis or theory more precisely, um, and hopefully get something that is uh, a useful theory or a useful uh, conclusion to their hypothesis. So what you would get here is we just have the lines of motion, and it's not obscured by the figure. Um, and that way scientists could, you know, perhaps like get some math and try to describe what is going on more precisely. You can also see how Murray has um, the distance lines very precisely in the pictures as well. Uh, so scientists thought this was pretty cool and were able to study motion um, in ways that are perhaps more useful for science. But they also look super cool. <laughs> so even if you're not interested in the science and you just want the aesthetics, these create some fascinating images. Um, so here's another example right here uh, where we have these images that are kind of amazing. Uh, and I don't require the textbook for this class anymore, but there's a painting that we'll see later on that I'll show you uh, that's also on the cover of the previous textbook uh, that looks kind of similar to this. So perhaps inspired uh, by what Maria was doing. So that's the end of this lecture. Hopefully you got a pretty good introduction to photography.